These days, people are writing a lot of books with titles like JavaScript, the good part, and you know, Java, the good parts, but I owe you more. You know, there, there's always the yin and the yang. So I'm gonna give you the, the full Monty today. I am gonna tell you about the bad and the ugly parts as well. Um, a few preliminaries I've gotta get out of the way. This is a highly opinionated talk. This is not, you know, pure technical fact. These are my opinions. They are not those of my employer or Kermit the Frog or, or Dr. Ruth Westheimer or, or anyone else. Um, the talk contains some criticism by nature, but I, I'm trying to be constructive here and I still love Java. So, um, this afternoon, I'm gonna be giving a much longer talk in which um, I discuss and critique every one of the 18 language changes between Java 1.0 and Java 7. Uh, it's chock full of code examples because this is a keynote. Um, you know, A, it's short, and, and B, I, I tried to have no code at all. I slipped and there's one example. Um, but what I'm gonna do is this, this kind of meshes with the talk because this is about where it all started. I'm gonna restrict my attention to Java 1.0, basically the language as it originally shipped and I'm gonna to try to tell you what the good parts were, what the bad parts were, and in my opinion, why it succeeded. Um, both talks, this morning's and this afternoon's, are limited in scope to the language because I just don't have time to cover the libraries. So first, the good parts. Um, these ones on this slide are, are I, I think, fairly well known. Uh, Java has a, a, it's a safe language with a managed runtime, and that means you got no seg faults, no scribble bugs, none of the things that C and C++ programmers coped with for so many years, and that um, also facilitates program portability when you have this managed runtime because uh, you, you are writing to a virtual machine, and that virtual machine, of course, can be implemented on various hardware, various operating systems. Um, they also tightly specified all the primitive types. In Java, how long is an int? You know, I don't know, it depends on the underlying machine. Could be 32 bits, could be 16 bits, and, and that's a problem. So I, I think, you know, once bitten, twice shy, uh, James and the James gang got that one right, um, and that was, that was critical. Um, it's also a natural accompaniment to the managed runtime because, you know, then you, you define all those types in the runtime and you, you, the runtime acts as a buffer between the realities of whatever hardware you're running on uh, and, and the program. Um, Dynamic linking was very important. Anyone who's spent a lot of time programming in C or C++ knows that when you change a library, you have to recompile every single client program, which meant clean builds were essential. And if you didn't do that, you got strange bugs and you spent a week chasing them down. So Java, by contrast, loads the libraries dynamically. And if you change the library, you don't have to touch the clients. Everything just works with one small but important exception that I'll, that I'll discuss later in the talk. And, and finally, I think a key basic attribute responsible for the success of the Java language was its superficial syntactic similarity to C and C++. It didn't scare the C++ programmers and the C programmers. In fact, they could take a look at a Java programmer and say, Java program, I'm sorry, and say, yeah, I, I know what that does. They didn't have to read the language manual, they didn't have to study, they just looked at it. So, in essence, it was an act of subversion. Um, you know, the, the, the Java language kind of snuck the essence of languages like Lisp and Smalltalk by the people who are used to programming languages like C and C++. And I think all, all of those things um, are important and none of them should come as a surprise to you. Now let's look at the type system. Um, it's object-oriented, which means two things. It means it supports encapsulation, and that was absolutely critical uh, because you cannot prove the correctness of components in isolation unless the components can isolate their internals. And then there's inheritance, and that was a marketing necessity. You know, we, we can argue whether you really need implementation inheritance or not, but in 1995, if you tried to introduce a new language that wasn't object-oriented, you know, you would have been laughed off, off the face of the earth. Um, there's multiple interface inheritance, which I think was a great idea. Um, the, the, the Java team basically looked at C++ and said, you know, it's great to be able to support multiple protocols, but multiple implementation inheritance is too gnarly. It just, there's too much difficulty that comes with it. So they, they kept the multiple implement interface inheritance and discarded the multiple implementation inheritance. 
And then there's static typing. Uh, I know these days it's kind of popular to dis static typing, but I think it was, it was critical for, for a couple reasons. The first reason is that it, and they actually maybe, maybe three reasons amongst our weaponry, um, it enables the IDEs to generate high quality code with, with very little effort on, on your part. You know, basically um, the, the auto completion says, ah yes, the type of this you know, variable is such and such, so these are the methods you can call, and that's great. It was also necessary from a performance perspective, especially in 1995. If they tried to do a dynamically typed language, they never could have achieved uh, the sort of performance in the sort of time frame that they did. Um, and, and then another reason it's important is that in order to get big business to take the language seriously, you know, they, they had to sort of be able to offer the kind of safety that you get with static typing. If you can compile it, it is unlikely to have a certain class of bugs at runtime. What about random features? Well, you've got threads. Threads are critical. So in 1995, it was the twilight of the uniprocessor era. You know, there weren't a lot of MPs for sale, but the, the, the writing was on the wall. But more importantly, you know, computing had changed from the days when you just had a big batch computation, you fed it to the computer, it did what it did. Computers were being used, you know, with, with microphones and speakers and, you know, all manner of, of sensors and computer programs were talking to each other on the network. So there you have concurrency, whether or not you have real parallelism with multi, multi processors, you know, you have concurrency and you need a language that can handle that concurrency. And many people had tried to add threading to languages that didn't have them, you know, with P threads and so forth, and they found that it was fraught with peril. Um, and in fact, even as early as 1995, academics were writing papers kind of proving that it could not be done, and, and Hans Bohm wrote another paper a decade later. But I think that, you know, if you talk to the, the concurrency elite, they will tell you it's simply impossible to add threading to a language after the fact. Uh, so it was, you know, very fortunate that they decided to put threading into Java from day one. Uh, garbage collection eliminates all of the pain heartache and bugs associated with manual memory management, and then, you know, exceptions. Er error codes had been shown to be error prone. If you look at C programs, people tend to ignore the error codes. And the other thing is that, you know, what do you do? I mean, you don't, you don't have, you know, seg faults. You're, you're way down in the execution of a program. Something bad happens. You have to do something. So you throw an exception. Um, and those were, were the key features. Um, it turns out, that what you leave out can be important as what you put in. James left out a bunch of things that had been assumed critical. Uh, exhibit A is lexical macros. If you look at a C program, it's all about macros. But macros have problems, especially lexical macros like C's. Um, and, and that decision turned out to be a great one. First of all, it makes all Java programs somewhat similar to one another, which means I can take my program, give it to you, and you can debug it without having to learn all of my macros. Uh, it enables programmer portability in that way. And also, it's important for toolability. We were talking about, you know, all of the uh, IDEs and IntelliJ, Eclipse, and, and NetBeans and so forth. Once you have macros, it's really hard to do auto-completion, you know? Um, multiple implementation inheritance was another thing that it was kind of ballsy to leave out, uh, and, and it turned out to be a great decision in retrospect. And finally, operator overloading. Um, operator overloading isn't inherently a bad thing, but untrammeled operator overloading as practiced in C++ is. You know, I mean, I think as, as soon as you start using the, the left shift operator to do I.O., your program loses a lot in the way of intelligibility, uh, and, and the, the Oak team just decided that they didn't want to do that. Finally, I want to discuss a potent pair of design decisions that are often overlooked. First of all, Java omitted support for header files. Header files in, in C and C++ are kind of a nightmare because you have to keep them in sync with the program, they're in separate places, and then it added Javadoc. I think Javadoc is the unsung hero in all of this. Um, Javadoc takes the documentation and puts it with the code, and everyone knows that, you know, it's it sort of made good documentation a part of the Java culture from day one. That's very important. But here's the other thing it did. Once you take those two design decisions together, you've co-located the interface declaration, its documentation, and its implementation. They're all together in one place. 
Now, if you change anything, you're almost forced to change everything else. So things do not go out of sync. Um, and I, I think that made Java a much better, much more productive, and much more bug-free language to program in. So I think those are, are pretty much the main things that made Java succeed. Now we're going to get on to the bad and the ugly parts. And in keeping with the Western theme of today's talk, you can see that uh, Duke there is holding a shooting iron, and he appears to be shooting off his own foot. So um, these, these are the cases where he, he shot off his own foot. Um, first of all, we have silent widening conversions um, from int to float and double to long. So basically, you can have a variable of type uh, long, and if you try and store its contents in a double, the language will say, sure, no problem, but it's lost information. That should generate probably an error or at least a warning at compile time. It should require a cast. So these are things that are supposed to be uh, lossless, but they aren't. And then uh, a related one, this is the only code in this talk, um, but it turns out that these uh, what are called compound assignment operators have implicit narrowing casts. So if you look at this code, it looks like the loop should iterate 16 times, right? We put in something with 16 ones, and while we're not zero, we shift it to the right once. Bang, 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 knock off all 16 bits, you're done, right? No, it's an infinite loop. Why? Because it actually turns into this. You know, it turns out the shorts turn into ints, and you just keep putting back negative one into that variable. Uh, so that was a mistake. Um, the operators double equals and unequals are reference operators. They should be uh, value operators. That is, they should call equals if it was assigned. It was a mistake to take the nice syntax and waste it on the thing that you rarely want to do. And it's a cause of frequent bugs for beginners. They, they compare strings using double equals, uh, and then they don't know why it doesn't work. Now, here's, remember when I said there was a chink in the armor of dynamic linking of libraries? If you have a constant variable, like a you know, public static final field in a library, that field is actually copied into the client. And if you forget to recompile the client, you don't get the new value of that. So that was a mistake. Once again, lots of subtle bugs. Um, what about constructors? Well, default constructors are bad. You forget all about constructors, and the compiler, in its infinite wisdom and mercy, gives you a public constructor. What if you didn't want a constructor? What if it's a static utility class? Or what if you didn't want anybody to construct a copy of the thing? You wanted to kind of keep it private. So that was a mistake. Um, and invoking overridden methods from constructors should be illegal because it's always wrong. Um, here's a bunch of miscellaneous things. Lack of unsigned int and long was a big mistake. And worse, bytes are signed. When do you use bytes? You know, byte manipulation, packing packets on networks, or doing graphics or whatever. The sign extension always gets in the way. That code is buggy, it's error prone, it's filled with nasty, you know, N0XF masks. So that was a mistake. The switch statement is not structured. It has fall through. Java is the newest language not to have fixed that particular error. There was no good reason for that. Um, arrays should have overridden two strings so that when you print an array, you don't get garbage. That's another one that nails every CS101 student. Exceptions obliterate pending exceptions. If you have an exception on the stack and another exception is thrown, you lose the first one. That's bad, uh, and it wasn't necessary. Um, and, and finally, clonable lacks a clone method. That makes no sense at all. And it shouldn't even exist in the first place. Clonable is a waste. You know, if, if you want to be able to create a clone, just, just put a method or in, in a constructor uh, to do so. So, in summary, the good parts are the key design decisions, the basics of the language James and his team got right. The bad and the ugly parts are largely confined to the details. A market window opened up in 1995 for a new language because people were pretty much sick of the ones that existed at the time, and Java jumped through it. Some people have said this was all hype and marketing. That's not true. Java's success was the result of the Oak team making all of the right design decisions. Well, no, not all of the right design decisions. Most of the right design decisions. And if you come back at 2.20, I'll give you a much longer talk with a lot more code discussing how we have built on this legacy over the past decade and a half and, and, and where, we, where we did it proud and where we dishonored it. Thank you very much.